In this video, you're in for a treat. Art Carden from Samford University presents Leave Me Alone and I'll Make You Rich. This was presented on the Susquehanna University campus in October 2023. Uh, thrilled that we're able to also post this for this audience. Without further ado, let's go to Art. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. I've, I've really enjoyed my day that I've, I've spent here at the university. Um, Samford University in Birmingham, Alabama is Baptist. And I knew as the place was filling up that I am in no way, shape, or form at a Baptist university because it filled from the front back <laughs> rather than from the back forward, which is really, really, really impressive and very, very different from uh, what I'm used to. I'm also impressed by the uh, field hockey players who seem to have run straight from the field to, to the talk. I was, uh, I was actually the faculty advisor for the field hockey team in uh, my old job at Rhodes College years ago. And uh, frankly, I still don't understand the rules. But for whatever reason, they, 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 they gave me that as a responsibility. So tonight, I'm here to talk to you about the themes in the book that Deirdre McCloskey and I wrote, Leave Me Alone and I'll Make You Rich, How the Bourgeois Deal Enriched the World. And we're going to do several things. Um, first, we're going to visit a magic time called the late 1980s and consider a classic film, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, and what that has to teach us about economic history. We'll talk about what, explain, what doesn't explain the difference between the world we live in today and the world our ancestors inhabited. We'll talk about what does explain the difference. And then finally, we'll talk about what do we do with what we know now, or what we think we know, about what explains the difference between the world that we inhabit and the world that our ancestors inhabited. But we begin with the film Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, which if you don't know the story, Bill, played by Alex Winters, and Ted, played by Keanu Reeves, are two slackers who live in San Dimas, California in 1988, and apparently their band, Wild Stallions, is going to make the music that completely changes the world and causes a peaceful um, utopian future if they pass their history report. And so, Rufus, played by George Carlin, gets in a magic telephone booth and is sent back in time to help Bill and Ted with their history report. Bill and Ted then go back through time and they pick up a bunch of different characters from history because the report is, the report they're supposed to write is what would great characters from history think about San Dimas, California in the year 1988? So they go and they get Socrates, Napoleon, Billy the Kid, Genghis Khan, Joan of Arc, let me think, Ludwig van Beethoven, Sigmund Freud. It's a pretty good and pretty wild group. Now I wonder what would happen. I wonder what would happen if we were to, to do something kind of similar today. If Bill and Ted had a similar assignment and their goal was, and their job was to tell Joan of Arc or show Joan of Arc how very, very radically different the life that we live today is from the life that she lived hundreds of years ago, where would they take her? Where would Bill and Ted, or where should Bill and Ted take Joan of Arc to show them the biggest difference or to give her some idea of the magnitude of the difference between the world that she lived in hundreds of years ago and the world that we live in in the year 2023? Does anybody have any suggestions? Where, would, where should Bill and Ted take Joan of Arc? Okay, so Iceland, to look at the banking system, okay? And there's a, there's a lot to be said for Iceland. Um, those, of us who are, those of us who have our heritage stretching back to the British Isles, Scotland, England, Ireland, et cetera, probably have a lot of um, Norse and Icelandic blood in us, in a sense, because an, you know, basically the history of England, in a lot of ways, was the Danes kind of coming over and slaughtering everybody and then going to Iceland, doing, doing more or less the same. Okay, but Iceland is an example of a pretty well-governed place. It's an example of a pretty well-governed place, and it's also probably not that, not much bigger. If I remember correctly, I, th I think there are more people who live in Fresno, California, than live in Iceland. Okay, so while it's a pretty well-governed place, it's also kind of tiny. It's a good suggestion, though. Where else? Take them to the kitchen and show them the spice cabinet. Flavor is a very big difference between the world that we inhabit today and the world that Joan of Arc inhabited. Okay. Now then, 
So we're talking about the Danes conquering, uh, conquering the British Isles. We can talk a little bit about uh, European colonialism. Every year around Columbus Day slash Indigenous Peoples Day, a meme goes around on Facebook and social media saying that one of the great ironies of history is that Europeans colonized the entire world for spices and then never learned how to use them. Okay. <laughs> Up until relatively recently, and indeed I, I think about my, my English and Scottish ancestors and wonder what in the world was going on every time I eat uh, a cuisine that actually has flavor. Okay, so yeah, the spice cabinet. Okay, and the spice cabinet for a couple of reasons. First, because we can actually season our food for flavor. Okay, and second, because our food is not rotting and our food doesn't stink and our food's flavor and aroma doesn't need to be masked. Okay, so we have a luxury of doing that. Where else? What are, what are some other places that we that Bill and Ted should perhaps take Joan of Arc if they want to show her the massive difference. Yes? That is a fantastic answer. So a public high school would be, would, would be a, or just any, well, a lot of places, would be a really, really interesting place to take Joan of Arc because, again, as a woman, the world she inhabited was very, very different from the world that we inhabit today. Um, <clears throat> you know, the mere fact of wearing pants you know, there was within the life, there has been and still is in some places, um, ongoing and animated debate about whether, whether or not women should be allowed to wear pants. Okay, so that's a pretty big step forward. Literacy is also a really big step forward. I, I'll periodically ask my students uh, in various audiences, if you could choose to live in Florence, Florence, Italy at the height of the Renaissance and Florence, Alabama in the year 2023, which one would you pick? Just out of curiosity, just a quick show of hands. Florence, Italy at the height of the Renaissance versus Florence, Alabama, 2023. Florence, Italy, all right, a few hands go up. Florence, Alabama, okay. if I may be so bold, the people who say Florence, Alabama are 100% correct 100% of the time. The reason for this builds on this point here, um, that if you were living in Florence, Italy at the height of the Renaissance, there's a vanishingly small likelihood that you're hanging around with all the people who are doing all the cool Renaissance stuff. You're probably one of the 80% of people in Florence who can't read, and you're probably on the verge of starvation, and you're almost definitely just covered in filth and grime and vermin. If you live in Florence, Alabama in the year 2023, you get to enjoy the fruits of the Renaissance. You're surrounded by people who are literate. You're surrounded by people who um, are thinking great thoughts, and if you're a woman, you're allowed to wear pants. And that, I think, is a pretty cool, pretty cool and interesting difference. Okay. Let's give one more. Where's one more, one more place where Bill and Ted might take Joan of Arc? The United Nations, first of all, to see how many countries there are in the world. Okay. The world's a much, much, much bigger place than the people of Joan of Arc's time thought. And second, the notion of the type of international cooperation and negotiation that we're able to enjoy that we have in 2023 is also something that would have been rather unique in war-torn Europe of several hundred years ago. I think that if Bill and Ted wanted to take Joan of Arc to one place to show her the radical difference between the world that we inhabit in 2023 and the world that she inhabited hundreds of years ago, I think the right answer is Walmart. I think Joan of Arc would be most blown away and would most appreciate the difference between standards of living today and standards of living then by going to the Walmart closest to my house. And why is this? Why is this? <clears throat> why would Joan of Arc be completely blown away by a trip to Walmart or a trip to Target or if you're really fancy, a trip to Costco? Well, a lot of it has to do with some of the themes, some of the themes that you guys raised. Okay. You walk around Walmart, you walk around Walmart, you see um, people from every tribe and tongue and nation. You see people of every socioeconomic, uh, every socioeconomic status. You can fill the spice cabinet. You see people wearing pants who would not have been allowed to wear pants not that long ago. People can read the labels. There are labels to read. And importantly, any Walmart or any Target or any large grocery store frankly, is a cornucopia of goods of all kinds, food, um, office supplies, camping equipment, well, maybe not at a grocery store, um, but all sorts of stuff. 
at relatively low prices and available not just to the elites, not just to the richest people on earth. If you go to a Walmart, if you go to a Walmart, you're, you're looking at a good cross-section of America, but most Walmart customers, particularly the one near me in Birmingham, Alabama, most Walmart customers are people of relatively modest means. This incredible cornucopia of food, entertainment, books, clothing, you name it, in variety that would have absolutely blown Joan of Arc's mind is all available to people of relatively modest means. And indeed, the Walmart customer base is almost, well not almost entirely, but they generally tend to, they generally tend to cater to and serve people of relatively low incomes. Okay? The fact that all of this is available to the least of these among us, I think is the most important fact about the modern world, and I think it's something that Joan of Arc, I would hope, would appreciate were she to see the world in 2023 and compare it to the world that she lived in centuries ago. <clears throat> now then, it has not always been this way. The journalist Jonah Goldberg puts it this way, and I quote, the natural state of mankind is grinding poverty punctuated by horrific violence terminating with an early death. It was like this for a very, very long time. One reason I wouldn't pick, pick Venice, Italy, is because life expectancy at the time was probably in your 20s, maybe your 30s, okay? If you were lucky enough to make it out of childhood, or shoot, if you're lucky enough to make it out of infancy, and then lucky enough to make it out of childhood, and then lucky enough to make it out of your teenage years, you might be able to expect to live to about 50, 55, maybe 60 if you're really, really lucky. The uh, scholar Thomas Hobbes described life in the state of nature as solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And this, I would argue, is a pretty good description of the world that our ancestors lived in. One of my mentors in graduate school, an economist named Douglas North, wrote that economic history is a depressing tale of miscalculation leading to famine, starvation, defeat in warfare, economic stagnation and decline, and indeed the disappearance of entire civilizations. If you're in an economics class and you've ever heard someone refer to what's called revealed preference, the way that my advisor in graduate school put it, he said, if you, look at, if you look at almost all of history, you might say that human beings have a revealed preference for being poor. We might extend that and say, human beings have a revealed preference for slaughtering one another and for being slaughtered. Today, however, things are radically different. First, there are a lot more of us. There are a lot more of us. The world population recently topped 8 billion. Okay. For most of history, there was hardly anybody. Okay. Today, the world's still pretty empty. Okay. The world is still pretty empty. New Jersey, as I understand it, is, is the most developed state in the Union, and only about 20 per, 22, 25% of it, I think, is actually developed. Okay. The rest of it isn't. Okay. Um, if you've ever driven in the West, if you've ever driven through Wyoming, or South Dakota, like just the amount of empty open space where we could put more people is really, really, really incredible. And fortunately, there are a lot more of us. There are a lot more of us and we live a lot longer. There are a lot more of us and we live a lot longer. Um, life expectancy in England and France at the beginning of the 19th century was about 40. Okay. And these are like the, the richest countries in the world at the time. Life expectancy in England and France at the time was about, was about 40. Today, in Nigeria, life expectancy is half again as long. You can expect to live, if you're born in Nigeria, you can expect to live 60 years. Okay? That's not long enough. That's not as good as Japan, South Korea, the United Kingdom, etc. But life expectancy, even in poor countries today, is much, 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 much higher than life expectancy for our ancestors. Okay? Since, someone, since someone mentioned changes in the treatment of women, over time, uh, I don't have a graph on this, but one of the major changes, one of the major demographic changes of the last several centuries has been a precipitous decline in maternal mortality. One of the unique things about being 44 years old in the year 2023 is one, I haven't had to bury one of my children, and two, I was never really that concerned that my wife might die in childbirth. Okay. That's unique. That's a big difference between the world, that we li the world that our ancestors lived in and the world that we live in. There are a lot more of us. We live a lot longer. We have much higher standards of living. The amount of output per person that we produce in the world in 2011 prices in the United States is 
rough, well, as of 2018, roughly $60,000. Okay. Now then, on a daily basis, on a daily basis, we consume anywhere from 10 to 20 to 30 to 100 times as much as our ancestors did. For the better part of history, for the better part of history, people who have tried to estimate this have estimated that people lived on the modern equivalent of about three or four dollars a day. My guess is a lot of people in this room have spent more than four dollars on coffee today. Now imagine having that to pay for all of your food, all your clothing, all your shelter for the day. Three, three fifty, four dollars. Now then, since I know that your dean loves Broadway shows, and I love Les Miserables, um, I will make a point that we make in the book and, and, and discuss something that I, I think is really important. So if you know the story of Les Miserables, um, one of the main characters is Fantine. And Fantine finds herself, finds herself in a bad situation. She has, has, a, uh, has a fling with a guy who gets her pregnant and then leaves. And she has a daughter named Cosette. And so a big part of, a big part of the, the play, or a big part of the book and a big part of the musical is about Fantine's struggles as a single mother trying to make ends meet. And so my wife and I went to see this, a Red Mountain Theater Company in Birmingham produced Les Miserables in 2014. And so we went and we're flipping through the program and there is a, there's an ad for a charity saying there are women like Fontaine all over Birmingham. Okay. And in some sense that's right. Okay, because there are women like Fontaine and that there are single mothers who are in very, very bad circumstances, maybe just because a relationship went sideways and who are really struggling and really trying to make it. In another sense, no, there aren't. There are no women like Fontaine in Birmingham. One of the things this ad pointed out is that the average household, the average household income for a single mother with two children is about $30,000. Okay. Well, you do a little bit of math, that's about $25 per person per day, if I remember correctly. Okay. If I, yeah, if I'm remembering that correctly. It's about $25 per person per day. The per capita income in France in 1820 was five dollars a day. That's the average in France. And believe me, Fontaine was way below that. Fontaine was way below that. So the modern day Fontaine, the single mother in Birmingham, Alabama, who certainly has a much harder life than I do, I will, I will freely admit that, and I can only imagine how difficult it is, nonetheless has a standard of living that affords her five times as much daily consumption, and each of her children five times as much daily consumption as the average person in France right around the time that Fontaine was, again, struggling to make ends meet in early 19th century France. So there are a lot more of us. We live a lot longer. We're producing a lot more stuff. And this, I would argue, is one version of the greatest story never told. The most important thing happening in the world today is, I would argue, the precipitous and rapid decline in extreme poverty. So the World Bank, uh, when, when this graph was made by the folks at Our World in Data, which is one of the best websites in the universe, um, defined extreme poverty as living on less than $1.90 a day. Okay? In, I think it was 2011 dollars, I believe. Okay. So this is simply incredible. Go back to the year 1820, almost everybody on the planet lives in extreme poverty, okay? Indeed, Fontaine is probably one of these people living on about $1.90 a day, okay? As opposed to the $5 a day that, that was the average in France, okay? More or less stays constant, more people, more people, more people, more people. It starts to, you know, population's growing and now we start to see this, this gap kind of widening. And then we get to about 1979, which is when I was born, and we start to see not just a decline in the fraction of people living in extreme poverty, but a decline in the absolute number of people living in extreme poverty. And that is simply remarkable. It's projected that by 2030, um, there will be, I want to say, I believe about 470 million people in the world living in extreme poverty. And that is 470 million too many as any decent people, I hope, would, uh, any decent person, I hope, would agree, but it is a lot better than having almost a billion people living in extreme poverty when I was born in 19, uh, 1979, um, and definitely, definitely better than almost everyone on the planet living in extreme poverty 
in the year 1820. So the precipitous decline in extreme poverty happening around the world, I would argue, is maybe the greatest story never told. It is one of the most important things happening in the world today, and it's one of the most important, one of the most important simple facts about modernity. Okay. What wasn't it? So there are a lot of different stories and a lot of explanations for why we got rich, for why the modern world is the way that it is. My co-author on this book, Deirdre McCloskey, is a, a renowned economic historian. Um, I'm very, very much the junior partner in this, uh, in this collaboration. She's written a three-volume set on what she calls the bourgeois era that, is, that provided the basis for our book. And she does the work and does the math and goes through and asks, if we're trying to explain a 1,600% increase in standards of living, how much of it can be explained by a lot of the usual suspects? Okay, it wasn't because of saving, she argues, and we argue. Though I will say, okay, and I'll sound like your parents for just a moment, because I'm probably actually old and I'm like I'm actually old enough probably to be your dad and it not be weird, which that's a new and weird experience for me, frankly. Um, so yeah, sure. I will sound like your dad for a second, and you should listen to your dad. You should save more. You should save more. Get your first job, start saving as much as you can, at least 15% of your income, put it in a well-diversified index fund, and you'll retire a multimillionaire adjusted for inflation. You will never actually have to worry about money. Starting at age 22, all your financial problems solved. So the whole leave me alone and I'll make you rich thing, literally if you take the advice I just gave you, you will be rich. Okay. You will be rich. You should save more. However, saving is not necessarily the thing that explains, um, explains big changes in standards of living. We would have slightly higher standards of living, perhaps, if we saved more. But saving might explain a few percentage points of the change in standards of living, not the entire 1,600 or so percentage point increase in standards of living that we, uh, that we enjoy today. And indeed, if anything, when Britain is going through the Industrial Revolution, the savings rate there is, if anything, low relative to a lot of other places. Okay. For the better part of history, saving took the form of saving seeds so you could have a crop the next year. And if you set aside a quarter of your seed, that's a savings rate of 25%. Okay. Much, much higher than it is in a lot of places today. So you should save more. We should all save more. Saving is great, and saving will make us richer, but it doesn't ex it's not the thing that explains the difference between a world where everybody lives close to extreme poverty and everybody lives in affluence unlike anything our ancestors could have imagined. It wasn't because of science. Okay? Science is great. Science is awesome. Science helps. And this might have changed. This might have changed. Basic science might have a, a, a closer relationship to economic growth now than it did at the time of, of what McCloskey and I are calling the Great Enrichment. But the history of science and technology is basically people figuring out how to do a thing and then only later figuring out how it works. Okay. People figure out how to do a thing, and then only later do they figure out the basic science explaining how it works. Okay. Now then, so I, I see a, a, a good number of athletes in the room. Okay. Good number of athletes in the room. And uh, if, you, if you're an athlete, how many of you are, like, how many, how many of you are physics majors? Athletes who are physics majors? All right. Okay, good. Okay, a couple of athletes who are physics majors. So how much, how much of your training in physics do you put to work on the field? Maybe a tiny bit, okay. How much of your physics training do you put, uh, do you put to use on the field? Okay, also probably, also probably a tiny bit, okay. Field hockey players, you guys doing vector calculus on the sideline? No, okay, probably not, okay. So you can be a really, really, really good athlete without necessarily understanding all of the physical principles underlying the goodness of the athletics. Uh, there's this really, really cool show called Sports Science. You can find clips of it on YouTube. And I remember seeing a clip uh, from Sports Science about Lionel Messi talking about like a bunch of stuff I haven't thought about since I took physics, which was like in high school. Um, and it's really, really incredible how Lionel Messi does what Lionel Messi does. But Lionel Messi does what Lionel Messi does, and then only later we figure out how it worked, or we figure out how it works. This is how a lot of innovation and a lot of the history of science and technology has progressed. We figure out how to make a thing, and then only later do we figure out how it works. 
So science helps. Science helped. We should have more science today. And again, the relationship might have changed. But in terms of the development of useful knowledge, basic science, basic science takes a back seat to a lot of other things. It wasn't because of stadiums and massive public works. In various versions of this talk I give in different places, there, there are places that are, are uh, uh, considering, considering using government money to build stadiums and, and things like that. It wasn't because of big public projects. It wasn't because we built the Hoover Dam. It wasn't because in Birmingham we just built a new football stadium, protective stadium, which is a nice place, but all else equal, probably not a very good use of public money. If anything, a lot of the big, massive public works are redirections of resources away from more valuable uses, not contributions to wealth and income. It also wasn't because of slavery. It also wasn't because of slavery. There's a popular story right now that we in the Western world, or we in the modern world, owe our prosperity to a history of exploitation. Slavery, imperialism, colonialism, or just generalized knavery. So you can think about it as an acronym, SICK. S for uh, slavery, I for imperialism, C for colonialism, K for knavery. Okay. In other words, unmitigated, untrammeled evil, it's argued, helps to explain how we got the modern world. Slavery provided, according to Karl Marx and others, the primitive accumulation of capital that led to the capitalist mode of production. Or industrialization was financed, perhaps, by the returns, by all of the, the benefits and the loot taken from the rest of the world on imperial European adventures or colonial adventures or what have you. And here, here the stories just don't work. The stories just don't work. There's nothing in history to redeem any of these things, slavery, imperialism, colonialism. You can't even say, well, at least we got an industrial revolution out of it. No, we are all today worse off because our ancestors indulged in the sins of slavery, imperialism, and colonialism. First, with respect to slavery, in, the, in American history, the contribution or the fraction of American output in the early 19th century that uh, we can attribute to slavery was relatively small. It's true, cotton was America's biggest export. But exports were only, what, I think 12, maybe 13% of GDP, maybe half of that was cotton. So if you're talking about 6% of GDP, that is enormous. That's enormous for one industry or one sector, but once again, it's not nearly enough. It's not nearly enough to explain a 1,600 percentage point increase in, uh, in human well-being. Furthermore, when you think about slavery, you think about imperialism, you think about colonialism, you think about the way that women have been treated historically, what slavery did, and here I'm gonna think specifically about chattel slavery in the United States where, where it was illegal to teach the enslaved to read. Um, what it did basically is it took an enormous share of the population and flushed their brains down the toilet. The historical treatment of women, so you mentioned a public high school. So allowing women to become educated well, this isn't true, or this hasn't been true in a lot of different places at a lot of times, and the way that the, that the economist Thomas Sowell has put it is these, these types of restrictions effectively eliminated half of the economic and intellectual capacity of the human species okay, by working against women's education. Slavery, imperialism, colonialism, okay, these were wastes of blood and treasure, and indeed, Economists who have studied the rate of return on the British Empire have found that it was actually negative. Okay? The British on net were taxed to pay, for their, to pay for their colonial adventures. They were not on net made better off. So there are a lot of good things it wasn't. There's a lot of bad things it wasn't. It was, we argue, because of new ideas. And specifically, it was because of new ideas about what was honorable and what was dignified. The first book in McCloskey's Bourgeois Trilogy is called The Bourgeois Virtues, Ethics for an Age of Commerce. And in it, she talks about how historically people have treated the Christian virtues of faith, hope, and love, and the cardinal virtues of courage, justice, temperance, and prudence. And for the better part of history, 
the kinds of things that we have venerated and the kinds of things that we've looked up to and the kinds of things that we've thought were honorable were not business. They weren't trading. They weren't innovating. They were feats of war. They were conquest. They were dousing yourself in the blood of your enemies. It was perhaps feats of piety. Commerce was looked down upon. Business was looked down upon. Being a business person was looked down upon. And indeed, in a lot of, um, in a lot of the literature of history, if there are business people in the, in the literature, then they're generally the bad guys. William Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice is an example. Shylock, the moneylender, is, is the villain in, uh, in The Merchant of Venice. And indeed, he's the only serious business character anywhere in Shakespeare. This started to change, however. This started to change, however, and we went from a world of uh, Theodore Decker's The Shoemaker's Holiday, which in the late 16th century was basically an open mockery of the idea of business and business people, to a play called The London Merchant, as sort of, again, kind of like an example of how the ideas and rhetoric changed um, in Britain, beginning primarily in the 17th and 18th centuries. Business came to be esteemed. Business came to be seen as honorable. Okay. How many people in the room are majoring in some sort of business discipline? Okay, all right. So a lot of people are majoring in, in business of some kind. Okay. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands on this, but my guess is that not a lot of people, if you go home and say, hey, I'm going I'm to major in marketing, nobody, nobody's going to be like, well, what are you going to do with that? Okay. I'm going to major in management. Oh, what are you going to do with management? Why are you majoring in management? Okay. It's generally thought of as a prudent, wise, good decision to major in something where there are a lot of career prospects. Where historically, it was considered undignified and perhaps even heretical to innovate, okay, the etymology of which um, state, uh, goes back to basically heretical read, readings of scripture. Um, today, everybody wants to be an innovator. We venerate innovators. We put them on the cover of Fortune and Forbes. Everybody wants to be a disruptor today. The cool thing to do is to disrupt this industry or disrupt that industry, turn this industry up upside down, turn that industry upside down. Okay. Steve Jobs, I would argue, the late founder of Apple, is in a lot of ways kind of the poster child for this great revaluation of the bourgeoisie. Okay. He's not universally loved, but at least he's respected. And in no small part because of his ability to envision a different future. His ability to come up with products, come up with ideas that people may not have necessarily known that they wanted. I think specifically about, I think specifically about the iPad. So I see a decent number of, of Apple logos in the audience, and I see a, a, a lot of people on phones and a lot of people on, on, uh, on tablets and things like that. These are revolutionary devices. Okay? These are revolutionary devices. And again, I think specifically about the iPad. When it was first unveiled, at first, people joked about the name, thought iPad sounds stupid. Okay. And second, a lot of people were asking, well, what is it for exactly? What's it for? Okay. And you know, Steve Jobs didn't have a particularly good answer, honestly. He's like, well, it's a cool thing, and here's some stuff that we, we, know, we know to do with it. Now, I can't imagine life without tablets. I can't imagine life without smartphones. I can't imagine life without small, compact, lightweight laptops. We found all sorts of cool stuff to do with tablets, all sorts of cool stuff to do with iPads, all sorts of cool stuff to do with successive, successive, successive stages of innovation. Now, historically speaking, historically speaking, if Steve Jobs had gone to a king or an emperor hundreds of years ago and said, hey, I've got this idea, I've got this idea for an iPad, he might have been, he might have been thrown off a cliff, he might have been gutted like a fish, he might have been hung, he might have been executed, and indeed, this happened with some regularity in different places. When people came up with new ideas, that was a threat to the social order. That was a threat to the hierarchy. That had to be dealt with, and that had to be dealt with violently. The Emperor Theophilus of Byzantium once was watching ships come in in the harbor, and he saw a beautiful merchant ship coming in, and he said, wow, who owns that ship? And his advisor said, well, your wife does. You know, your wife owns that merchant ship. And he gets angry. 
He says, I'm the ruler of a great nation. You would make me a ship's captain? And he orders that the ship and all of its merchandise be burned. Okay. Today, we would call that crazy. Today, we would call that profligate and wasteful and horrible. His advisors, in fact, praised him because indeed, yes, business, being a mere merchant, that's below the dignity of a king or below the emperor or below the dignity of an emperor or below the dignity of a god. Today, and again, this is not perfect, and there are all sorts of problems with it, but today, we generally esteem folks who want to do things like become a good middle manager, or go into consulting, or become a good accountant. That's one of the major differences between the world we inhabit now and the world we inhabit then, and as McCloskey argues, and as I, as I, and as I agree, it's what set innovation ripping. It's what set innovation ripping, and now we live in a world of iPads and iPhones, Uber and Lyft. It was also because of liberty. It was also because of liberty. We had liberty to innovate. Okay. The, uh, the scholar Adam Thierer uses the phrase permissionless innovation to describe a society in which people can just basically come up with whatever they want and not have to ask anybody's permission to do it. This is an ideal. It's something that we honor in the breach, and it's something that we certainly don't necessarily um, that does not necessarily work the way that we would like it to all the time. Indeed, Uber and Lyft, which I mentioned earlier, were almost killed. They were almost strangled in the crib by a lot of municipal governments that were afraid of them. Okay. Fortunately, I was able to take a lift to my hotel last night after I got in super duper late, one hour lift ride. It was a whole lot safer than sleep deprived me being behind the wheel of a rental car. Okay. Letting people or respecting people's liberty to try new things, respecting people's liberty to innovate respecting people's, people's liberty to try to identify assets in low value uses and move them into higher value uses is one of the things, again, that helps to explain why we are so very, very rich while our ancestors were so very, very poor. It was because of new ideas. It was because of liberty. It was because of dignity. It was because, once again, we came to respect business. We came to respect buying low and selling high. We came to see these, once again, as things that are not necessarily instant and immediate corruptors of the soul. One example of this, I would argue, in history is Walmart, the place where we would take Joan of Arc if we were going to try to show her just how radically different her world is from our world. And Walmart got its start when this guy named Sam Walton, who ran a bunch of Ben Franklin stores in northwest Arkansas, thought, you know what? I bet really large-scale discount retailing will work if we put a big Walmart in the county seat of middle-of-nowhere Arkansas. Okay. And he tried to convince people of his vision. He tried to convince people of his vision. And he would go and he would hire people. Or he'd make job offers to people who worked at other discount chains. And these people would go to their bosses and say, hey, this Walton guy's offered me a job. Uh, can you match the offer? And his bosses at the other discount chains would say, hey, look, if you want to go with this Walton guy, he's crazy. Go ahead and ruin your life. Go ahead and go broke. There's no way this is going to succeed. And here a few decades later, Walmart sits regularly atop the Fortune 500. It's one of the most successful innovations of the last few decades, it's fundamentally, and in a lot of ways, changed the way that we shop, changed the way that we ship, and changed the way that we live. The fact, first of all, that Sam Walton had the liberty to do it, and second of all, that he didn't feel like he had to be ashamed of doing it, helps to explain again why we are as wealthy as we are. Now then, this makes me wonder, this makes me wonder, because one, one of my favorite games when I travel is to open my suitcase and play, what did I leave at home? And fortunately on this trip, as far as I can tell, the answer is nothing, which might be a first. It might be a first. On a lot of trips, I end up having to go to a Walmart or a Target or a Costco or somewhere like that uh, in order to get a belt or a shirt or a tie or toothpaste or just fill in the blank with any of a number of things that I tend to leave at home. I am being served by an army of people who don't know me, who might care about me in an abstract sense, but may not really like me that much if they got to know me, who might know that I have kids but don't really care about them as much as their own kids. 
Why, I wonder, are they there for me in my time of need? Do I have an answer? Anyone wake up this morning at Walmart, uh, wake up this morning, go to work at Walmart and think, you know, there's an economist visiting from Alabama. And if there's anything we know about economists, it's they're incredibly absent-minded. And if there's anything we know about people from Alabama, it's that they like to shop at Walmart. So I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna stock the shelves because I really care about this economist who might leave something at home and who might need to come in and buy it at Walmart. Did that happen? No, it did not. The people at Walmart and Costco are there for me. They're there to take care of me. They're there to take care of my family, to look after my interests because of this, this beautiful principle embedded in a modern commercial society, and that is the principle of exchange based on our own interests. Now then, when people, when people hear about self-interest or hear about own interest or they hear about Adam Smith or the invisible hand, they read a quote like this, where Smith writes, and I quote, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. They read this as sort of an apology for selfishness. Say, oh, Smith is saying that you should pursue your own interest all the time. Be selfish, screw everybody else. I don't think that's what, that's what Smith is saying. I don't think that's what Smith is saying at all. I think a lot of what he's saying in a passage like this is that other people have dignity. Other people have liberty. Other people have rights. Other people are not mere means to our ends. It's presumptuous to go in and stamp our feet in the bar or the bakery or the butcher shop and expect to be fed because we're hungry. Because after all, the butcher, the baker, the brewer, they've got their own families. They've got their own problems. They've got their own issues. The best and most expedient way to get them to care about my issues, to help, them, to take, to help me take care of my family, is to provide something in exchange that will help them take care of theirs. Liberty, uh, liberty for and dignity of exchange, again, helps to explain the modern world. And it's one of the reasons why we can see forward into an even greater enrichment than anything we could possibly imagine anything in the world or anything that we, that we currently understand and experience now. So what do we do? What do we do? First, I would argue we roll back rules. Okay. Walmart has price rollbacks. Let's have a rules rollback. Get out of the way of people who want to cut hair. Get out of the way of people who want to drive cars. Get out of the way of people who have new ideas and don't ask them to expect permission from the rest of us to ask them to explain, well, what does it do before we let them come up with something like an iPad? I would argue the best thing we do is first of all, we get out of the way. And second, second, we ourselves go forward exhibiting the virtues of prudence, courage, uh, excuse me, prudence, courage, justice, and temperance, faith, hope, and love, that we ourselves embrace innovation, that we ourselves embrace commerce, and that we ourselves that we ourselves embrace a world of free and responsible people where we can trust strangers with candy. Indeed, if you've eaten candy today, or you've eaten candy recently, you've taken it from a stranger, and you trust them. You trust a stranger who made it, a stranger who grew the cocoa beans, a stranger who swirled it into chocolate, a stranger who turned it into a Snickers bar, all because you have a brand name to go by, and it's in their interest to take care of you. I dedicated this book to my kids, okay, Jacob, Taylor, Grace, and David, with the exhortation that almost all of the good they do in the world will be for people they will never meet, and it will be without necessarily intending to help them. Frankly, I think that's a beautiful thing. I think it's a beautiful thing. The greatest story never told is a huge decrease in global poverty, we can see forward into a greater enrichment if we let things work the way they should. And I'm happy to take any questions you all might have over the next, what, 10 minutes or so? Basically, however long y'all want to hang out. Okay, sure. All right. Yeah, so, so saving helps, but 
if we're trying to explain a 1600 percentage point increase in standards of living over the last couple hundred years, saving is kind of a drop in the bucket in terms of, ex in terms of ex explanatory power. And moreover, the saving rate in England in the 19th century was in fact actually relatively low. And that was the, that was the, the seed of the Industrial Revolution. What was driving it was new ideas. Um, someone once said a wave of gadgets swept over England. It was this wave of gadgets that swept over, that swept over England as a result primarily of innovation and new ideas and not so much increases in saving. So yeah, would, so yeah we would definitely, we would be richer if we saved more. But if we're trying to explain the difference between $3 a day and $100 a day, saving doesn't really do a whole lot of the, doesn't really do a whole lot of the explanatory work. Yes? So, so all the data or all the numbers I've used are inflation adjusted. So, so this is, this is in con presumably in constant dollars. Um, inflation is weird because it's only when inflation gets really, really high and really, really volatile that it really starts to matter a ton, uh, at least for, for long-run economic growth. So um, inflation's bad, obviously. And uh, I think there are a lot of things that we could do, presumably, to, to control inflation, but we really have to work hard to wreck the whole system through inflation. Oh, get out of people's way to let them innovate and embrace business and commerce and innovation ourselves. Okay. Think about... Um, uh, one of the stories I, or one of the exhortations I kind of give to my students, this, this goes back to a story a, a friend of mine told me. I used to live in Memphis, and uh, I had a, a friend that I went to church with who designed stores for Kroger. And so I'll make this a little bit more concrete. He designed stores for Kroger, and I remember one time we are talking, and he said he wants to do something where, like, he really wants to make a difference in the world. He really wants to make a difference. And it's like, dude, you design grocery stores. Your entire job is to make it easier for people to get the food that they need to feed their families. That's a pretty big deal. That's a pretty big deal. And I would like for us to embrace more of that, to recognize that you are in fact feeding the hungry, you are in fact clothing the naked, you are in fact sheltering the homeless simply by being a good manager, being a good accountant, being a good stocker of shelves at the grocery store, being a good physicist. Other questions, uh, another one here. So, so there are a lot of, people are, are proposing a lot of different alternatives to GDP per capita as a measure of, as a measure of the, of the well-being of a society. Um, and GDP per capita, so those of you who are not economists, when we talk about GDP per capita, we mean gross domestic product per person, and gross domestic product is the market value of all finished goods and services produced in a country in a year. Okay, that was on the econ quiz that my students took yesterday. Um, it's basically a measure of the amount of stuff we produce, and it has all sorts of incredible imperfections and all sorts of incredible problems. Um, but it's quite literally good enough for government work, and it is very, very, very highly correlated with all the stuff we'd really like to be able to measure. Okay. So it has its problems, but first of all, it's really highly correlated with all the other stuff that we think is important. Um, and second, it's not clear that a lot of other measures, uh, like human development index, say, or um, happiness statistics and things like that, a lot of those are, are a lot more ad hoc. And again, um, you know, so highly correlated with per capita GDP that it's not really clear we're getting a lot of additional explanatory power from that. This I will say, this I will say, if you can come up with an unambiguously better measure of standards of living, then the Nobel Prize is yours for the taking. Okay. The Nobel Prize is yours for the taking. Simon Kuznets won the Nobel for his work on GDP. If you come up with something better, then again, uh, Nobel announcement is Monday. So you've got a long weekend for it. Should businesses be free to do whatever they want? One of the major things that restricts businesses from doing whatever they want is simply competition. Um, when I go into a Walmart or go into a Target or go into a Waffle House, um, I know more or less what to expect, and I'm treated decently, even at Waffle House, because there's a lot of competitive pressure. Okay? There's a lot of competitive pressure. And second, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff in, in legal tradition that is going to be off limits. Fraud is wrong. 
All right, so don't, so you shouldn't, you aren't allowed to, you've never been allowed to defraud people, you shouldn't be allowed to defraud people. Um, murder is wrong, stealing is wrong. So all of this stuff is, is already sort of outside the lines in terms of, in terms of what is legal. Um, as for the extent to which rules and regulations work, it's true that something like the FDA means that our drugs are safer. But first, we have far fewer drugs. Second, and even your dean's not convinced. Second, those drugs cost a lot more. Third, those drugs take a much longer time to get to the market. And fourth, pharmaceutical companies and other innovators have incentives to work on like, stuff that's only gonna be a home run. Okay. If you have to spend 15 years and a billion dollars developing a new drug, then stuff for minor aches and pains is not gonna, that's, that's not gonna pass a cost benefit test. Or stuff for, uh, and the FDA has, has uh, started fast tracking drugs for what are called orphan Ill illnesses, right, which only affect a, a handful of people. But if you can fast track those drugs, why not fast track all the other drugs? Okay. So I think that there, I think that there, there are sufficient, um, first, there are sufficient incentives and restrictions in standard laws that like are embodied in the Ten Commandments, you know, thou shalt not murder, for example, to, to handle most of the things that businesses shouldn't be doing. Second, reputation is a really powerful mechanism for keeping businesses on the straight and narrow. And then third, most of the rules and regulations that we have, and I could talk about this for the next hour, and will if you want me to, um, are what we would call barriers to entry into the marketplace, where they exist not so much to protect consumers as they exist to protect firms from potential competitors. So uh, to use just one example, and since you, mentioned, since, since you mentioned women and Joan of Arc a moment ago, so I've been thinking about this this whole time, um, there's this really great book by an economic historian named Sheila Ogilvie uh, called The European Guilds. And it's about medieval European guilds. And in a lot of the medieval European guilds, you are not allowed to be a member of the guild if you were a woman. Now the public interest or the, the uh, public safety rationale for the guilds was you wanted quality. Okay? You wanted to make sure that the, people, that the people you're buying meat from or buying bread from or buying whatever from knew what they were doing. Um, but one of the major reasons for the guilds was to exclude potential competitors. And I think a lot of the rules we have today are not so much to protect the public as they are to protect entrenched already existing businesses from potential competition. Well, first, it's pretty clear, like, everything you just described is already illegal and immoral, and it's happening anyway. So the existing rules, the existing rules and enforcement mechanisms are clearly not doing anything to stop it. Um, my, my depressing answer is the world is a very, very broken place, and you're going to have lots of horrible stuff happening pretty much all the time in a world of 8 billion people who are soaked in sin. My more, um, my more optimistic answer is to ask, well, why don't these people, why don't these kids have better opportunities? Why don't they have better opportunities? And one of the reasons for it is because it's, is, and again, this is something else I gotta talk about for the, the extra hour after I talk about the guilds, um, and I promise I'll finish on this, is that it is extremely difficult to move to the United States legally. It's extremely difficult to move to the United States legally. Um, if you made it easier for people from low-income countries to move to countries like the US, First of all, global income would skyrocket, increasing anywhere from 50 to 150%, just by making it a lot easier for folks to move from poor countries to rich countries. And second, I don't think people would have to, they wouldn't have to take these, de these desperate measures where they're dealing with, in a lot of cases, people who are kind of the scum of the earth to get into countries like the US so they can work illegally, so they can work in the black market. If we can move all of this above ground, I think a lot of, a lot of these problems would, would not go away completely, but they would be substantially better. Okay. All right, I know it's eight o'clock, and I know you guys, you guys have stuff to do, places to be, et cetera. Thank you so much for inviting me out to the university. <laughs> had a wonderful time. I hope you enjoyed this. Thanks for making it to the end. Please like and subscribe if you are not subscribed to this channel. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video.